But I remember when I went to the O'Neill for the first time and I showed you my portfolio and then you're looking through like, oh, your puppets are very nice. You're very nice. And then, uh, but the one thing you were telling me is about, I, I need to take better photos of my puppets. And one thing that you said is like, is that I can take a really good photo of a bad puppet and make it look great. And, you know, and a, a bad photo of a good puppet will only ever look at best okay. Great. And I said that. <laughs> you said that. Yeah. And I was like, wow, well, I was like, oh. Oh. Puppeteers Podcast presents Cheers to Puppeteers, a special fundraiser to benefit the direct relief fund for puppet artists, helping puppeteers of America impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. We have nine very special episodes featuring some of puppetry's brightest stars. You can support this effort by unlocking episodes early, purchasing Cheers to Puppeteers swag, or making a donation to the direct relief fund all at puppeteers.com slash cheers. Let's lend a hand and say cheers to puppeteers. We now return to your previously scheduled podcast. Welcome back to Puppeteers. We're your hosts, Adam Krutinger. And Cameron Garrity. And today we're talking to Richard Termini. Welcome to the show, Richard. Well, thank you both for having me here. I'm very excited to, uh, to sit down and talk to you both. So Richard Termini, for anybody who doesn't know, is uh, just a tremendous mentor and um, puppeteer to both me and Adam and to so many others. He uh, is a UConn grad, uh, is one of the co-founders of the National Puppetry Conference at the Eugene O'Neill Theater Center. Uh, he's one of the staff photographers over at Sesame Street. He's worked in the Muppet shop uh, himself and is just a wonderful um, as I said, mentor and educator and just a good friend of ours. We are so excited to have him here for our Cheers to Puppeteers series. Richard Termini, welcome to Puppeteers. Ah, thank you both. I'm so honored to be here. Thank you, Pam. And thank Adam you. For Absolutely. It's, it's long overdue. Like we were talking before, we've mentioned you in many, many of the episodes because of the influence you've had on us and because of your own work. But before we dive too deep into that, well, let's just find out what you're working on now. Do you have any special projects right now? Well, um, most recently, I've been involved in the 52nd uh, uh, season of Sesame Street and photographing on set. And so that's exciting, very exciting in these uh, pandemic times uh, to be able to get back into, into the studio and to, to be with all these talented people on the show and to be documenting their incredible work. So- Wow, um, oh, wow. that's interesting. Very, uh, yeah, it's been very slow for me. Uh, actually, this is the first time, first time I've been, been unemployed because all of the theaters and concert halls uh, everywhere I work is closed. So because yes. uh, in addition to being a, a photographer for for puppet work, you're also just an arts photographer and, right. and doing all that. So, right. um, wow. Yeah. And so um, when when you're photographing on, on Sesame Street, I know a lot of the pictures that you take end up being used for promotional photos and things like that. Right. But um, especially at a time like now where things are so. Um, out of the ordinary, do you um, see it as part of your responsibility to sort of just capture the set at this time and what the behind the scenes are? Yes, great question, because indeed, uh, the whole uh, pandemic protocol on the show is such a, a big part of how we are proceeding that I have been shooting behind the scenes, uh, documenting the staff, the special staff that is there, that is providing uh, all of the protocol that's necessary to, to keep the performers and the entire staff on set safe. Um, and I can go through some of the things that were, you know, in terms of being tested every two days to be on the set. Uh, everyone is masked uh, except the performers when they're about to do their scenes. Um, there are distances that are maintained on the, on the uh, set. We have a, an app that we fill out prior to getting to the show every day. It, it's quite a rigorous um, uh, protocol that is in place to keep everyone safe and healthy. Yeah, uh, yeah. Going it's into the so, so important. I mean, we, yeah. we were talking with Pam and Marty back in March at, at the beginning of all of this. And, you know, there were concerns about, can you even you know, right hand anymore. Uh, so the fact that you guys are back, um, even if you're you're doing all these precautions is, is just so important to to the audience. 
Yeah. And, and a question I have based on hearing this too, is of course you've done these types of behind the scenes photos, um, you know, for years for Sesame street, do they, do you seem to be documenting more now because of what a historical moment we're in? I think so, or, or more behind the scenes. Like I've gone, this is the first time I've ever gone into the control room and documented in the control room, all of the staff that are working, facing the monitors, everyone is masked even in the control room or prior to getting to the set or, or even the COVID tests. I've tried to doc, document all of that. So it's part of the archive. And I've been in touch with the Sesame Workshop uh, archivist who is interested in that photography because it is so particular. Never before in the 52 years of the season have we been, uh, you know, faced with this and 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 um, and the the staff uh, performing that way. Yeah. Do you also do uh, small video clips as well? I don't. General. I, there was a point when I did, but generally. Um, there is a, a social media person on set who hasn't been on for this season yet that would do some of that and would post some of those possibly. So okay. I, I'm, I'm especially doing the, the, the stills is what uh, my responsibility is. Yeah, I'm so glad yeah. that, that they, they have you doing this because I, I could have imagined a world, you know, back in March when they might have thought of, uh, you know, maybe set photography is not an essential aspect of this production. And just to, to limit the numbers of people, but uh, but then again, again, I mean, Sesame Street is such a historical, uh, you know, production, and an we're in such a historical yeah. moment. Yes, yes, an institution, yes. such a historical moment that's important to document these things. I can imagine a you know a documentary coming out maybe ten years from now is uh, you yeah. know showing how many productions were able to get through this, and and this yes. is an important part of Sesame Street's history. Exactly. And that it is able, able to continue on in spite of this is truly remarkable and, and, and uh, important to, uh, to document and, and note this. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So I want to know, though, because uh, Richard, you and I are both glasses wearers, um, and it's hard enough for me to like walk out of my house without my glasses fogging up. Yeah. What's it been like to have to be taking photos uh, with either a mask or face shield or, or both on? Well, in fact, there are face shields, but uh, for uh, I've been able to use uh, plastic uh, side pieces here, guards on my glasses. And, but it does take, uh, they haven't uh, fogged up on set because the temperature is pretty consistent. Oh, but yeah. it's, uh, I feel like my hair is, is down over the, you know, the reflection that happens within the guards, it takes some getting used to. But, uh, but I'm lucky I don't have to wear goggles over that or a plastic shield. We could just right. get a prescription camera, right? <laughs> get the lens. Yeah, exactly. They I probably make those, well. right? Yeah, but by, by now. <laughs> Canon's had five months to figure something out, so, or <laughs> nine right. months. Yes, yes. Oh, gosh. Oh, yeah, can I get the Canon 5D nearsighted, please? <laughs> yes, right. yes. Well, actually, you, you are able to adjust to your glasses the focus of mm. to adjust to your whatever your prescription is on your oh. glasses. So that is a, a dial within the viewfinder of the camera to adjust it. So it's very precise to your glasses. Oh, really? Oh, okay. wow. I didn't know that. Yes. Yeah. I'm not yeah. a glasses wearer, so I didn't realize that that was, I did notice it would get out of focus, but I didn't know yeah. that it would necessarily affect, yeah, of course it would affect the yeah. person's vision. Who and people it. will take my camera up to, I'll say, take a shot, they'll put their eye up and, and they see it out of focus and they're trying to adjust, not realizing that I've adjusted it to my glasses. Oh, wow. And to my yeah. Wow. Huh. I, wow. I'd never, never thought of that before. Holy cow. All right. I'm glad I'm asked. Um, well, we'd love to go go back uh, and sort of find out uh, how you became the artist that you are today. Um, what what was your sort of artistic upbringing growing well, up? Well, I'm going to I have some slides, so I'm just going to tap into my uh, my images that I prepared here. Great. That will help me uh, uh, reminisce with you both. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> okay. A visual okay. tour. So my. Um, affinity and my connection with puppetry began very from early childhood. And uh, I have here a photo of an early Christmas, approximately 1961, with a, a Jerry Mahoney puppet that I had. And uh, I also had Pelham marionettes. Uh, and this is a, a cardboard stage I had, and I still have this marionette. And uh, uh, an important experience for me was in grade school, 
there was a, a school assembly and a production, a marionette of a uh, production of Rigoletto. And at that performance, I, I think I was dabbling with puppets at that time, but at that performance, I was hit in the most amazing way. I was moved and it was like a, 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 a lightning bolt hit me in terms of uh, the experience and what I felt uh, watching this, uh, this production. I immediately went to the library and I started to, you know, I took out the books on marionettes, on puppets and started to build them. And uh, it, uh, and my father built marionette stages for me and I built uh, numerous puppets. And so it really took off from that point. And um, what, how it evolved was I continued through high school. If there was a woodworking shop, uh, a woodworking class I was taking, I was building puppets. It was something that I was, any way that I could, um, I, was, I was involved in puppetry. And during that time, uh, I met a, um, a graduate student. I was living in Connecticut. I grew up in Middletown, Connecticut. And I met a graduate student uh, from the University of Connecticut, Carol Thompson, who uh, went to UConn and majored in puppetry. And uh, by the time I was, a, this was approximately when I was a, a, a junior in high school. And also I should mention at that time, um, there was a special on PBS called Muppets on Puppets. And at the end of that, it, um, it, it mentioned the Detroit Institute of Arts as a puppetry center. I wrote there, um, the uh, staff member there recommended I join P of A. And this was in 1967. So all of that was taking place. Uh, any exposure that I could have to, uh, to puppetry, I was, I was taking in. And I met this student, a uh, graduate student from UConn. She brought me up to UConn. And at the time they were rehearsing, uh, Frank Ballard, who created the program up there, was directing a production of The Love for Three Oranges. And this was an amazing, uh, based on the opera, the Prokofiev opera, and it was a full stage production. I went to rehearsals and then went back for the performance. And then that summer, this is in the in 1970, and this was during the, um, during the uh, moratorium, during the Vietnam War, when the college campus has closed down because of all the violence with Kent State and demonstrations. And that summer as well, uh, UConn was hosting uh, the Puppeteers of America Festival. Mm -hmm. And the Love for Three Oranges was opening that festival. And uh, Frank Ballard needed puppeteers because all the students didn't come back. So I got to puppeteer on that production. So this is when I was a junior in high school. Wow, and, that's, wow. That's, that's amazing. amazing. So you know, was, I, I got a quick question though yes, about, yes. Uh, because you, you know, you show that uh, the Jerry Mahoney picture yes. first. Of, I'm just quite curious, is that like, how did you end up with that? Is that something a relative threw at you? Like, here, play with this kid. Or we, did you see it at the store and be like, yeah, buy that yeah, for me? Yeah, it was like at the Macy's, which was G. Foxes and Harford uh, sold in their toy department store, sold puppets. So I had uh, uh, Pella marionettes and I had the the cloth, the hand puppets as well, the German. So these the, were things the, that you I, asked for? Yes, yes. Okay. And my parents uh, uh, were very uh, supportive throughout yeah, my yeah. entire life uh, of, of you know going into puppetry and all of that. So it, as a matter of fact, it was my mother that introduced me to Carol Thompson, knowing, uh, you know, meeting her, hearing mm. that she went to UConn for puppetry. So there was all of these connections. Mm. And so well, I got, uh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Alex. Oh, no, I was going to say too. Um, so uh, again, I'm just a little fascinated by the Jerry Mahoney puppet a little bit too. Yeah. Like when you yeah. saw it, did you want it because it was a puppet or were you familiar with Paul Winchell and his work and that character? And and that's kind of what- I think it was, more that I, it was more that it was a puppet. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And, and what I did also is I would rebuild these puppets and uh, I would uh, redress them. And uh, so um, the design and, and, and uh, fabrication was a big part of this for mm -hmm. me. And um, as a matter of fact, I, uh, my grandmother, my Italian grandmother had a, uh, a sewing machine, a treadle sewing machine 
that, sh that I, my other grandmother taught me to work and I still have to this day, day. It's gone with me everywhere I've gone and I had it repaired and I would sew with this uh, treadle sewing, Singer sewing machine from the 1920s. Oh my goodness. Yeah, so, uh, so definitely the design and the staging were a big part of it. I wasn't, puppet, I wasn't a great puppeteer as, as you'll, you'll, I'll tell you as we go along here. Pish posh. Yeah. <laughs> hard, hard to believe. But what, what was it then about, was it the, the, the staging and the craft um, yes. that sort of captured your imagination yes. yeah, when you saw staging, that, that production? To me, theater and being moved by theater and the visual and all of the emotional, the music, all of that uh, really moved my soul. And, mm. and I was really connected to that. So, yeah. so that, that's um, what got that, you inspired to start getting your hands on and start building stuff too. Exactly. Then, right? And what also the, the interdisciplinary that, that puppetry is encompasses all the arts. This yeah. was very attractive to me. Well, there's one thing, you know, to being inspired by, by this art form to take part in it. And then there's another kind of aspect of really being able to grow yourself and grow those skills, because no matter how much you, you just, yeah. how much you want to be better at a skill, you have to really work at it. And things like sewing and sculpting and these elements of it did, uh, what do you think helped you the most in being able to develop those skills? Um, I don't know. That's a good question. I mean, I definitely spent a lot of my time uh, you know, not, I had two older brothers. We were all very different and my interests were not the, you know, the, the standard, uh, you know, the standard, uh, Oh, you don't have to tell us we're, we're puppeteers too. <laughs> you, you know, you know that. <laughs> we're so, puppeteers uh, and I was a figure skater growing up. So oh, there you go. So, you know, uh, as a matter of fact, destined uh, for otherness. Fact, what's that? I'm sorry, Cam. <laughs> I just said I'm destined for otherness. Yes. So. yes, exactly, exactly. As a matter of fact, someone was fa fabricating a couple of years ago at the O'Neill was uh, calling out to uh, uh, the conference and was going to create a theater piece, puppet theater piece, with the audience and live. And they wanted to. They were asking special questions, and they asked one of the questions they asked is, "What was your uh, most disappointing Christmas gift?" And I immediately shot up my hand and I said, a football uniform. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and everybody oh, looked at me moment. like, you know, for a brief moment, they were like, what? And then they put it all together. So <laughs> yeah. yes, they realized yeah. who, who it uh, was who was yes. saying it. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so, uh, oh, so anyway, at the festival, I have to show you this is the first picture I ever took of Jim Henson and Carol Spinney. They were oh at the gosh. festival. Carol was the co-artistic director of the P of A festival with Frank Ballard. And so this is a photo that I took of them at the festival in 1970, not knowing the history that would later uh, would transpire between us. Okay, so wow. yeah. anyway, I thought you'd get a kick out of seeing that. Oh, definitely. Then here, the next picture I wanted to show you is I, um, at UConn, I was an undergraduate and a graduate student. And this is Frank Ballard here. And in, as a graduate student in 1976, I did my MFA project, which, which was the death of Dr. Faust by de Gelderode. And so this is the, the pup, this is uh, Bart Rockaburton. And uh, here I am here, Jan Rosenthal, Rachel Prescott, and Brad uh, Williams. So they were all, this was in that production. And uh, Brad was an extremely talented uh, in every way uh, performer. And he did this poster for my production. Uh, originally it was a gift he did a, as a rendering and then he created this artwork. Uh, and Brad uh, was the lead character. Here's a puppet of the devil. And it was done in the round. It was done in a Mobius environmental space and it was a whole um, thing of double actors and double puppets. At one point, the, uh, Brad was the, the, uh, the puppeteer for this and he turned around, the devil puppet turned around and took off his hood. And there was Brad uh, giving an inner monologue for the character. Oh, wow. That's really, we're so that, powerful. That must have been beautiful. Yeah. And I'm sorry, I, uh, you may have said it and I may have missed it. The, yeah. So you had gotten into UConn? 
I did. As an under, I didn't get in originally. I have to be honest with you. I, I wasn't accepted originally because of my my academic grades. So I went for a semester to Southern Connecticut College, and then I transferred to um, to the branch in Hartford, and then I finally got up to campus uh, by okay. uh, by my sophomore year. So I was that determined. Yeah. To, wow. to pursue that. And could could you just uh, describe a little bit because we've we've had Bart on the show and a couple yeah. other UConn people who have um, sort of auditioned for the program once Bart was there. But um, can you describe what the if it, what if any the the performance requirements were when when Frank Ballard was was there? So as an undergraduate, there were no uh, uh, there were no audition requirements. And I was more of a, a performance uh, major, but I was taking puppetry classes, but I was definitely ex exploring acting and I took environmental theater classes, uh, which was with Jerry Rojo and the environmental work. And I really brought to that together in my final uh, performance of uh, my final production, which I had to stage and light, uh, design, do all aspects of the production. Uh, for my audition, uh, as an undergraduate for the graduate program, this is a marionette I created in Ballard's class. And this was for uh, Bernstein's um, Sing God a Simple Song from Bernstein's Mass. So I performed that as an audition piece. And my last semester as a graduate student, Albert came for his first residency uh, at UConn. But this puppet was actually created, um, it's a Christ figure and was created for Ballard's marionette class. Wow, this is beautiful. It is beautiful. Um, thank you. And it, it was a very contemporary, it's a sort of a jumpsuit. So it's a very universal Christ figure uh, puppet. And it, and it performed a prayer dance uh, to, uh, to a piece from uh, Bernstein's mass. Was it uh, frustrating at all to, because again, what we've heard of that program from at the time was uh, it was, really kind of Frank using his students to to put on his own main stage show. Did that ever feel limiting in in what you were doing when you were at UConn? Um, it, it didn't because um, I had uh, I had a wonderful working relationship with Ballard. And uh, for example, we did um, I had seen two by two, for example, with Danny Kay in previews in uh, in New Haven prior to Broadway and uh, the same year we did th that I did this piece, we did two by two and Brad Williams was uh, played Noah and I was the assistant director and I to Ballard and I did co, co, co did costumes. So I, he gave me some responsibilities and really nurtured me. And um, he was like a second father to me artistically. Um, and uh, so it was really, uh, uh, I felt in terms of my own growth, he very supported by him. I have to tell you one story about Ballard, and, and oh, this yeah. goes back to, and I think you'll find this sort of uh, interesting, is, uh, you know, he, um, my last year's there, he discovered that he had Parkinson's, and he, and he dealt with it for 30 years, and his, and his last year's, I was visiting in, in, with him in a convalescent home in Mansfield, and we were, I was making, you know, trying to make conversation with him, talking with him, and and so I, I said to him at one point, I said, you know, I don't know all these years, I don't know if I ever told you of how, you know, what the initial experience that really was the catalyst in terms of becoming a puppeteer, you know, going into puppetry. And I said, you know, there was this production of Rigoletto at, in school, uh, you know, the school uh, uh, assembly, and it, and it was just this, uh, you know, lightning bolt and this flash that, you know, this is what I wanted to do. And he turned to me and he said, I was the advisor on that production. And oh my so gosh. it was like, uh, you know, the full circle of my relationship and my life was right there in that moment. And you just don't know that hand and where that hand is and how it is, is helping to shape you and mold you. Um, so that was uh, an incredible, uh, incredible, uh, you know, sort of connect, reconnection with him. Absolutely. Holy cow. Awareness. Wow. <laughs> that was really oh, amazing. Yeah. Um, so I always carry that with me. Yeah. 
I, I, I bet. I so then, what came the after? Uh, what what came after UConn then for you? So what happened was after UConn, I uh, I was part of what was called CETA, which was like it was the um, it was a uh, comprehensive employment training act. It was like the works. Uh, Progress Administration under Roosevelt, but this was initiated under Nixon and then went on with Carter. And there was an arts uh, group in Willimantic that was a CETA creating jobs. And I became the director there for about a year and a half. And we did a production of The Little Prince that we pirated. And uh, my friend Jan Rosenthal, who I went to Yukon with, did the designs for this. It was all soft sculpture. And we toured with that. Then after that, I got a job for a couple of years um, at uh, colleges, upstate New, uh, upstate New York. And um, let's see, where did I do this? I, uh, this is a production I did in the 80s. And, I, uh, and this was going back to the original play, one act play of Madame Butterfly. Madame Butterfly was originally a one act and then it was, it was based on a story, then it was a, a one act play, and then it was created into a, an opera. And this was in the mid 1980s. I, I took a leave of absence from Muppets and I directed this at Nazareth College. And the reason I like to share this is directing was really my first passion in puppetry. And, and I'm really proud of this because at this point I created the the little boy was a Brun Raku puppet in the production. And, uh, and this was a poster that was done by Brad Williams, who I went to school with, an incredible designer. And he did this, uh, this poster for me for the production. So this was, I was doing some college work. I taught for two years. And then Jan uh, Stafura, who I, I worked with at Muppets, got a job. She was with me on the CETA project. She went to Muppets and worked with uh, in the workshop. And in 1980, uh, she was working in, in, on the Muppet Show in London. She came over for the Unima Festival in Washington, DC, which Jim produced. I went down to Washington and it was June or July. And we met down there and I said to her, I said, and I had always resisted Muppets. And I said to her finally, I said, could you get me an, uh, an interview in the workshop? She called up to New York. They were doing a arena show. And so that's how I got an interview. On my way back from Washington, DC, I stayed with Brad. He was living in the, in the city and I went for an interview and I got hired for two months to work in the, in the Muppet workshop. And I wow. gave up my teaching work. Wow, and that's I just, amazing. Yeah. You know, I've got, I have a, two questions from that. First of all, <laughs> who, who, who did you interview with then? Who, how I, did you? I interviewed with uh, Connie Peter, Peterson, who still works in the workshop, oh. and yeah. with Ray Diffin, who was a costume designer and uh, with the opera, with the Met Opera, and had just come on to oversee that project. The wow. arena shows were always created in Minneapolis, and this was the first one that was being done in house. This wow. is like Sesame Street Live type. Yes, that's exactly what it. Okay. That's exactly what it was. Wow, holy cow! You know, the other thing I was wondering too. You said you resisted the Muppets. <laughs> yes. So, <laughs> talk so, a little bit more about that. <laughs> well, um, this is being a theater snob, and this is I have to admit <laughs> I've I've not always told this story. But when I was at UConn, there were uh, people Muppets and Sesame Street were just beginning. Uh, it was sixty nine. Sesame Street was 51 years ago, 52 years ago, uh, Sesame Street was uh, premiering. And uh, I, was, I was very much of the theater. You know, I was gonna do theater puppetry. And uh, so I was not, as much as I loved the Muppets and, and, and the wonderful work they were doing, and I was not a Muppet performer. I was not that kind of verbal performer. I was very much of the theater. So I very much resisted that sort of, I'm gonna go work at the Muppets. Yeah. So, I see. But then teaching, I started to feel like I really haven't had the professional experience to really be authentic in terms of what I am, I am sharing here. So that's why I ultimately uh, pursued that, uh, um, that opportunity. Yeah. Uh -huh. Now, and, and being at that 1980 festival uh, yes. where the Muppets put on 
you know, yep. quite the show uh, yep. will include it's it's been circulating recently, it, it ended up on YouTube. Yes. Um, and just to see, I mean, to see the Muppets live uh, is, you know, pretty, pretty exciting in itself, but they had so many full bodied and costume characters and stuff. Did that help you appreciate some of the theatricality that could have been achieved? Oh, oh definitely, I, I definitely, and I, and also Jan was writing me from uh, from London her experience on Muppet Show, and, and so all of that, and I all got also got to see Julie Taymor there. It was a, an amazing, uh, you know, festival. It really uh, was quite uh, quite wonderful. Yeah. Uh, so I did that. I went to New York, worked for a couple of months, got laid off. And uh, ultimately was teaching a little out on Long Island, but went back and started working at Muppets in the, in the, in the shipping room, in the art department, anywhere I could fit in. And uh, ultimately, and I was just meeting with Carol Lee Wilcox, who was the head of the workshop. She tapped me on the shoulder in the art department and said, how would you like to join me on Sesame Street? And that's how in 1981, I started working with her group for specifically for Sesame Street. Wow. Um, wow. And so here's a, uh, we did other projects. This was a show called Little Muppet Monsters. And this is a still here. I'm on the ladder here uh, during, doing one of the takes. Here's my friend, Jan. Uh, this is Will Morrison who headed up the, uh, the um, workshop at the time, Richard Hunt puppeteering. And I believe this is um, Noel McNeil here. Oh, that's so great. And then here's my friend, Jan, who we worked out. She's from, was from Manchester, Connecticut, an incredible builder designer, ended up uh, ultimately at Fisher Price and lived in Buffalo, by the way. And oh, no with, kidding. I was, yeah. I was just going to say, that's <laughs> yeah. right in our backyard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She had, started, worked up there and then started her own toy design. And uh, she was my best friend. Uh, unfortunately, she's no longer with us. She passed away and uh, such a loss and such an incredible talent. Uh, but she was the one that got me uh, my interview and my job there at Muppets. This, Actually, you know, a quick question in case yes. I, I missed it. Are you doing photography uh, as a side hobby this entire time too? Uh, you know, well, what happened was is that um, Jan started taking, some, she was a real influence, uh, influence on me. So she started taking some photo, photographic classes. So um, that sort of put the bug in my ear. Then uh, when I was teaching upstate New York, um, I, had a, I was doing technical directing. There was a student that was doing photography. So we set up a dark room and I started dabbling in photography then. So that's when the seeds were sort of planted. And then I was in the workshop. Um, this is Placido by the, the way, one of the a few characters, one of the characters I designed. And let's go here. Then I started documenting. So when I was in the workshop, I started taking up the camera and documenting what was happening around me. And um, one of the things that Carol Lee did with us is that when we built something on the show, I was in the workshop, there were people on the floor of Sesame Street, but when we built something uh, pretty uh, substantial, she would have us go onto the set and we would do the rigging and we would do the follow through during the taping and we would learn by that process of seeing what we built, how it worked, how well it worked and what we could have done to enhance it and how we needed to rig it to make it work. So when I was there on set, I saw there was a still photographer there. I was dabbling in photography and I thought, hmm, this is something freelance. I'd like to do this. So I started to take some classes. And there was so much happening around me in the workshop. Here you see us, this is what we were doing, uh, um, the Christmas toy show special. And here is Jim, he would come in and I would see Jim there and I started to document him. Here he is in the workshop. Oh my gosh. And Ed Christie is showing some prototypes of what they're developing. Bonnie Erickson's there, Tim Miller, all these other staff builders, Tom Newby, Fred Buckholz, all there. And, and in the conference room going over the development uh, in the construction there. That's remarkable. You know, one, one more thing I just want to point yeah, out to the yes. listeners, just because I know we have such a wide range of audience and there are some younger people that watch this. Yeah. I mean, this was at a time where taking on, taking photos to document something was no small task. 
you know, because I think a lot of people now take it for granted because, you know, you don't have to develop the fr- the film yes. in the same way and develop the photos. And, exactly. and really, it, you're essentially limitless now in the amount of photos you can really take. It's, it's exactly. so disposable the yes. way that you can just kind of be like now you can just kind of spray and pray. You just take, take a yeah. billion, yeah. billion <laughs> photos and exactly. hope something comes out good. Like That's back then, right. you, you really had to put it was a lot. I hate to say it's more of an art back then, but I can't think of a better way to say it in this moment. Yeah. You really had to put a lot more thought in every single time you took that picture. This is so true. This is uh, the speeds that I, I I would be shooting at a speed of, of the sensitivity would be at 160 ISO, for example. Now I am at 64,000 in terms of what I can capture the, just the resolution and all of that and the freedom. I would shoot when I first started on set, I would have a black and white film camera and a, a, a film print camera and a color slide. And I would do a setup and I'd have to switch lenses and bodies and the cam- the performers had to, have to wait. And I have to say, now I have to get into black and white. I did it in color and, and this sort of thing where you were now it is such a and not a, only that too but you might you you might get a development and realize oh it's all it's all trash it's all garbage yes yeah. whereas now you can just immediately look yep, yeah good let's move on yeah. right you have the immediate feedback exactly yeah it is so it's such a, a remar- remarkable the technology now is is so remarkable yeah but but again i just want to just for the people listening to you, i wanted to point that out too because again yeah. just because like now it's so instinctive for people just to take pictures of things it, it, it wasn't back then right right you're really right. capturing history at a time when not many people were doing it right no it's true it, it, it and it was and there was so much visual happening around me here's another shot just to give you an idea this was uh, someone ed christie's workstation and this was a character that he was a bunny turns into a dragon but you could see the sketches all the richness here that i was able to document that's beautiful. Yeah, I love these photos. At the same time, here's a picture of Kermit Love. So I started to take, now I'm working in the workshop, but I started to take a photo classes and I was surrounded by wonderful, talented people. And I had to do a portrait, for example. So I went to Kermit Love's workshop and we went outside. I said, can I take a portrait of you? So this was one of my first portraits someone on the staff of, 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 you know, who worked with Muppets and he built the original uh, Big Bird and continued to work with Jim. And so this is, I, I love to show this off in terms of, of what was available for me. Yeah, do you mind yeah, that's an exciting us- first person to take a portrait of. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, we've heard a lot of amazing stories about Kermit Love. Yes. And I can only imagine capturing this very moment was in some there must be a little bit of a story there because so uh, I can imagine him you know, in, in a time where you could see the f- photo. I could let him see, see him like, oh, let me take it again. And like yeah. doing different poses and based yes. on what we've yeah. heard. Well, you could see his eyebrow was up. He very much was <laughs> conscious of image, was yeah. knew how to play to the camera. Every year he would be on New York Magazine as Santa Claus, yeah. on a motor scooter as Santa Claus, you know, very, a variety of different. So he was used to, uh, to a certain degree of, uh, you know, knew to bring his, his uh, bowler hat out. He was very theatrical just in, in, in getting to know him and talk to him. So he was a perfect subject for the camera. Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, here's another picture that I like to, I, this is a, a, one of my first puppet pictures and I just like to put, show you this, is when I first started taking photos, I had all these puppets around me and I created a composition. So this is a, 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 my Faust mask. Here's my a marionette Christian, uh, my first marionette uh, Hansel, a Pella marionette, my Indonesian and a Muppet uh, character, but just creating from what was around me and starting to see the potential of photographing puppets. Um, just wanted to share that with you. I love that. Uh- I'm yeah. trying to remember, I, I believe you may have told me this, or I could have made it up in my head by now at this point, but um, did you also start docu- taking photos to document the puppets themselves um, in terms of like scale and just for for reference for when they needed to be rebuilt? Yes. So uh, in the workshop, we would have a seamless paper. They had a yardstick that was marked with tape per inches 
and then you would do profile, uh, front, side, back views of the, the characters. And those images would go into uh, their, uh, their, uh, their pattern folders, their pattern envelopes as reference. So uh, I, as they saw that I was doing photography, I might be asked to do things like that, uh, to do a documentation like that. Yeah, no, that's that's such a an important tool uh, to to have have all that. I am it, it's making me think of though, uh, and Adam is has shared this story uh, on the show in the past about how um, depth of frame in in measuring photos can sometimes be uh, an issue. Adam, I don't know if you want to throw in about the the glasses here uh, for like Avenue Q puppets and stuff. Oh, no, um, yeah. Well, and even at that point, if we're talking about cameras, even the type of lens you have, the distortion exactly. it could potentially have on on documenting these characters. Yeah, um, so like how much the measurement, uh, you know, where you would even have to place the that right. yardstick uh, in relation to the character so that it was an accurate, uh, right. accurate uh, record. And you want to center the camera on the object is another thing. So you're not distorting perspective either way. Mm -hmm. That you're, mm -hmm. you're keeping it dead on as much as possible. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's important. Yeah. I, I even do that for a lot of my uh, pattern pieces and stuff myself. Just, uh, you know, just to, just to get it in, in a digital form so I can either digitally trace it later or just in case, who knows, <laughs> I spill coffee on it. Yes. At least I have a starting point, right? Exactly, a reference, very important. Um, let's see here. Um, what also happened here is another photo I have is in uh, 1987, uh, Jim was invited to go to Charleville Mezières to teach a puppet video workshop and for three weeks in the summer of 87. And so I went as his teaching assistant to do the construction of the puppets. And um, so these foam puppets. So these were all, pat I had the patterns, I brought over the foam and I would do the construction component to the workshop. At the same time, I was dabbling, continuing to do puppetry, uh, photography. And I, I started documenting, I documented Jim in this workshop. Uh, and so these are some images from uh, Jim teaching and doing the workshop there. So, which was remarkable. Uh, it was it was great. Um, at this time, also now I'm going to jump ahead to. So I worked with in the workshop till about for about seven, eight, till about 1987, 88. And um, what I did also was as I started to do photography, uh, Carol Lee, who was the head of the workshop. And we were doing Sesame Street for about six months out of the year. I was doing exhibit work and other projects, Fraggle Rocks, whatever, um, is that I started to take six months off and do my photography. And uh, during that time, I was up at Williamstown Theater Festival. So it was really a wonderful way to work both the photography and the puppetry. And uh, by 1988, 89, I left finally Sesame Street and I started full-time and, and Sesame Street became my first uh, full-time or my first client. But mm. also in 1991, Jim had passed away in 90 and we started the O'Neill Puppetry Conference. And Jane Henson invited me to be a part of that first group. Um, and so uh, I was the associate artistic. We were also living out in Cleveland because my Husband Roger was uh, at the Cleveland Playhouse. So I was photographing out there. I was commuting back and forth. And George Latshaw lived out in uh, Cleveland. And so Jane said, oh, G George Latshaw is out there. Why don't you become the associate artistic director? And uh, you could work together out there and then do the conference. So we did. And in 1991, we did our first conference together, which was Puppet and Video. And here Jane is instructing uh, Tim Legasse and uh, Peter Lintz. And uh, I have to say, this is very important to me, is that right from the onset, we decided that we were going to take on the O'Neill model of developing new work for the puppet theater. And that we just did this puppet video workshop as a way of starting the conference. But this is really not what we were 
It was a way Jane recommended just to get a Kickstarter for the conference. But after that, we were really dedicated to new work. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And it, it that persists to this day. Yes. Um, and that, that's not to say that there aren't, um, you know, the, no Muppet style puppets allowed. <laughs> yes, exactly. But it's, it's how can you, you know, take that and incorporate your knowledge from from one field into shadow puppets or marionettes or or tabletop or, exactly. or all those other things. Um, and that's one of the best things about going to the O'Neill too, especially if you don't have a background from coming from like the from Yukon puppetry department. It's just you do kind of you're kind of forced to at least see a breadth of work of different styles of puppetry. Uh, and, and going there really expanded my horizon so much into forms of puppetry that I never thought I'd have interest in. So exactly. yeah, without a doubt. Exactly. So here's some images of uh, of the O'Neill. For the 30 years, I was I was artistic director for uh, for 11 years, and then um, have continued to mentor there, as well as photograph. So I have numerous photographs. This is one of my favorite. This is uh, Jim Rose and his mom, uh, Margot Rose of uh, the Rufus Rose Marionettes. They were a part of and the reason that, that uh, puppetry is at the O'Neill. And uh, this is a, a, one of my favorite shots of, of Jim with one of his marionettes in the workshop. Um, I also mentioned that, that we were dedicated to developing new work. So in the second year in 1992, uh, George Latshaw developed a piece and I directed a piece as well and, and we, um, came up with the idea through one of the participants of uh, doing newspaper puppets. Do John Cretion, a, a student of Bart Rockaburton's, was part of the staff there. And he said, oh, I just came from a workshop and we did all newspaper puppets. So that's how we came to do, and this is a production of Diary of a Madman that we workshop there. And you can see script is in hand, scripts are on the, on the, uh, on the stage, and uh, we developed this piece, we did a portion of it. And I went on to create the whole piece. This is with Daniel Tamulonis. And uh, we performed this at a, I did it at the New York Fringe Festival. We took it to a puppetry festival and it won a uh, Unamai citation. So I'm very proud of this. Uh, and this originated at the O'Neill. So, and I have the puppet here as well, I can show you. Oh yeah, I'd love to see it. Would you like to see yeah. it? So here is uh, here's the lead character. It's a modified Boon Raku. And uh, the hand of the puppeteer goes into, into the sleeve here. Let's see here. Like so. So this is him here. And, uh, and ultimately, he, um, it's a, it's a Gogol story. And ultimately he goes insane and he, he's in a, an insane asylum and his head is shaved and he's truly broken by the end of the piece. And, uh, you know, just, so anyway, so that's, uh, one of my characters here. Yeah, I love that style so much, and and I wish I wish we could see more of it because it's amazing. Even though it's a, a puppet that doesn't have facial exp expression, being uh, looking like it's carved wood, um, there's still so much expression that comes out of it. Even with those little hand movements you were about touching the face and peeling the wig off, there's just so much nuance that you can still get out of it. It's telling a story. And also the, 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 light, the play of light and shadow, oh, highlight and shadow on the face and can change the expression as well. Yeah, yeah, oh, big time. True. Um, other pieces, I, I, we did participant pieces there, which were smaller pieces. So I'm showcasing some of my work here. I hope you don't mind. No, 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 <laughs> no. Uh, this was an early piece I did, um, and it was a chair piece. I, I ended up collecting. I love miniature. Uh, my whole fascination with uh, scale and all of that. And so I had all these chairs, and we created. This is Ron Binion, and uh, his name escapes my mind right now. I've got to fill this in here. But anyway, uh, this is a character, and. Um, this is Henry, and he's right here for you. Uh, I, I just did a workshop on armaturing puppets. So he's another table, but he's, ar he's fully armatured. 
Oh, but wow. It's using Muppet material, but not, uh, you know, it's using Antron and, uh, but he's, but he's totally armature. So he's very rigid right now, but it's a tabletop character. Okay. And then I also, other pieces that I developed at the O'Neill, this is with Pam um, Arciero and Mark Petrosino. I, I did pieces that were torso, and this was a painting piece where they dealt with live, uh, uh, real paint, painted each other, each a mannequin in suggestive ways, and then ultimately struck out with the paintbrushes at each other. <laughs> oh, that had to be a blast to to watch yeah. and perform. <laughs> uh, yeah. oh, can you, can you, I mean, you've already shown us so many just yeah. incredible and beautiful photos. Um, and I'm sure even uh, back when, you know, the photo taking was more precious, you know, there for every great photo, there were, there were 10 on the ground. Can you kind of quantify your best practices of, of what makes a, a strong and captivating uh, puppet photo? or photo in general, but, uh, well, yeah. well uh, that's a great question because, uh, for me, the underlying and, and how does a puppet come to life? This is the important consideration when, uh, photographing puppets, a puppet comes to life through sound and movement. So in terms of a photo, you have a still image. It's important to capture that sense of movement and that sense of action. And that's when the puppet is alive. So you want a, a sense of gesture and movement and also the quality of sound. Of course, a, a photo can't make sound, but if the image, if the puppet has a sense that it's cr uh, creating sound, then that adds another dimension to the, to the image that brings it to life. Also, you're dealing with theater. So you're capturing events. You want something to happen in the photo. There needs to be um, relationships within the character, within the, the, all the objects within the photo, both props and puppet, relating to each other, uh, between puppeteer and puppet. Focus, relative focus, important is that the character is seeing, that the illusion that the puppet sees is so important to bring puppets alive. So in the photo, the illusion that the puppet is seeing in the photo, that it is focusing, that is seeing outside of itself, that is also an important um, part of the uh, puppet uh, photography being successful. Yeah, and, and I, one thing I wanna point out to, to that yeah. is I think those are things that even the average professional uh, photographer might not, they might understand those concepts, but yeah. to you, what makes you so great at this is how you already understand puppetry. Cause a lot of those things that you mentioned are the same types of things to even bringing a puppet to life. As far as like, you know, even like having the, the tilt, health tilt of a head of a character yeah. so that you can see both pupils to make it seem more alive. Right. And those are the same, you learn that from doing puppetry, yes. but it's also something you directly apply yeah. to your photography of puppetry. Right. And trying to, and, and for me, the, the, uh, the experience of photographing is uh, very organic and being, uh, getting a sense when I'm shooting a dress rehearsal, whether it's actors or puppets, it's learning the, the language that is in front of me and then being trying to anticipate where it's going so that I'm ahead of it as well. That uh, I think my, uh, my sense as a director really informs my ability to record performance. Um, and also another thing I like to use that image of the proscenium. As a director, when, I'm, when I was directing puppets and being able to create within that proscenium, now my proscenium is my viewfinder in the camera. So just as much as I was, uh, to, to, was framing on stage and creating images on stage, now I'm doing that within the camera with the elements that are in front of me. And I'm moving with it. I, and I'm creating maybe in angles that aren't created, that aren't seen by the audience always. Maybe it's a side, maybe it's a top. It, I, I can have that fluidity in terms of how I'm creating. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Well, and I, I think that's really evident in in the work that you do in, in documenting Sesame Street is, uh, you know, expanding the frame and letting us see what's happening 
um, you know, that connection between the puppet and the puppeteer. Right. Um, and you're sort of sharing that, that additional story, that, that story from the sidelines that right. so often um, people don't get to see. Right. right. And for a long time, they didn't want to show that. I have to, uh, I have to add that um, because they wanted to keep the illusion of the puppets for the children. They wanted to keep that alive. Yeah. So it's very selectively that they'll show those photos behind the scenes. Are they still selective? Of it? I think it's eased up a lot more, especially yeah. with social media mm. and that and that sort of thing. Yeah. Right. Wow. No, that's th those are all great tips for people who would you know be trying to take pictures of uh, of their own puppets, which I know that's something that you've also done uh, workshops on. I know recently you did one with a little shadow production. So uh, right. Jean Marie Kevens. Right. Uh, right. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to be there for that one, but I, I've, I've taken your master classes uh, on it over at the O'Neill. And um, and actually, I remember something that I, I think I've said in the podcast before, but I remember when I went to the O'Neill for the first time and I showed you my portfolio and then you're looking through like, oh, your puppets are very nice. You're very nice. And then, uh, but the one thing you were telling me is about I need to take better photos of my puppets. And one thing that you said is like, is that I can take a really good photo of a bad puppet and make it look great. And, you know, and a, a bad photo of a good puppet will only ever look at best okay. Great. And I said that. <laughs> you said that. Yeah. And I was like, well, I was like, profound. and literally, literally, I got, I went home and bought my first DSLR. And then, I was, and I remember thinking, oh, a, fo a photo is a photo. I was taking all yeah. cell phone pictures. Yeah, yeah, and just yeah. to be clear, between now and 2013, cell phone pictures have also come a very long way and they're much better. Yeah. But, but back then, um, you could tell immediately. And I took my first picture of a puppet with a DSLR. And it wasn't even a good photo, but it was, oh my gosh, the difference. Leaps and, and bounds. I'm like, I'm like it made my puppet look better than it actually is. He was, he was right. <laughs> I love it. I love and, it. And while we're also on the, uh, you know, you were talking about being in the theater um, and anticipating things. Uh, I know another thing that you've talked about is potentially if you have this luxury, uh, working with the show's lighting designer um, in really uh, taking archival photos of the show, potentially having them, um, either lighten things or, or darken things on set, they might feel like you're doing them a disservice, but ultimately, um, you know, you're, you're really capturing it the, the best it, that it can be. Can you describe that a little bit in some more detail? Yes. Um, and sometimes it's not even uh, with lighting um, or working with having the luxury to work with a lighting designer, uh, but um, the, uh, the, for example, when I'm shooting puppets and puppeteers of having the puppeteers find their light with that is there on stage, tilting their head so they're catching the light. Small adjustments like that can make all the difference. Yeah. Um, and, and them not even being aware of, of where their light is, but in doing a setup, and that's the beauty of sometimes doing a setup is, um, is being able to have the puppeteers make those adjustments so that or tightening compositions for the frame of the photo things like that that you you can't always get when you're shooting live yeah and i remember you telling a story though where of um a similar situation but where um, the lighting uh, designer wasn't as appreciative of it because as we both know, uh, you know, photography is an art form, but lighting in itself, especially theatrical lighting is an art form in itself. Yes. And that, uh, and you were asking them to change the lighting for the photo. And they're like, no, this is my art. This is how yes, I want yes, it to yes, look. Yes, yes, yes. And then you had the hard job of t telling them that like, I'm trying, the camera sees things differently. Yes, exactly. And I want to make it look the way it looks to your eye in the right. camera. Yeah. The latitude of what an exposure is in a camera is much more limited than what the eye perceives. Mm -hmm. And, and is, uh, so that knowing that restriction and, and using Photoshop afterwards, you can open up the shadows. I oftentimes will work on something if I have the luxury of, of, of time to do that, of opening up shadows so that I can give more detail, so that I can make the image more complex and more related uh, in terms of interrelationship of puppeteer and objects and puppets. Yeah. So that, that's all things to consider. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's excellent. Yeah. Yeah, I guess, I, what would you say is the biggest difference between, you know, 
uh, or um, difference and or advice you'd give to people between taking photos of puppets while they're being performed versus puppets that are um, armatured? Hmm. Well, I think that the, the danger of the armature is that the puppets don't have that sense of life. Mm -hmm. So in terms of giving them gesture and action, you know, even just angling the camera a little um, can add an energy and a sense of movement to the picture. Mm -hmm. So that, there are certain things that will give it a little more sense of uh, spontaneity, of energy that, uh, that, a, um, that armature characters might not have. Mm -hmm. So there are pros and cons to be aware of. Wow, interesting. No, and it's it's funny. You wouldn't always think that um, that there would be that much of a discernible difference in the final piece. But Adam and I have done photo shoots where oh, yeah. we think that we'll like we'll armature something, and yeah. it's just not looking right. And finally, one of us will say, "It's from." above the waist anyways just put the puppet on and it's <laughs> what you're yeah, able to do in the angling and yeah, stuff can yeah. sometimes be just so much more dynamic yeah. and yeah. and capture that that essence of of the performance which is and really also what, too i mean just like because of just the way gravity works on characters yeah. it, it affects it you know and 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 the most obvious point where you recognize this is when you have a character that has like the feathers on top of the hair i've done that for photos before of my puppets where i just set up the puppet on a stand beautiful pose take yeah. the picture like oh it just doesn't seem alive yeah. and then i go i like this i go <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> and then just just that little movement sure. just oh my, it brings the whole thing to life yeah and you might want to use a little fan in that situation yeah. is the other thing. Yeah. Put a fan on a stand and move it around and see where, you know, from behind, whatever, and see how that affects it in terms of giving movement. Yeah, uh, find the, the sweet spot. The and even the fur, too, depending on, yeah. you know, how it's styled and yeah. whatnot. Um, yeah, there's a lot, lot, of, lot of things. Uh, it, it, can, it can really, you know, again, before I really just took my photos pretty willy-nilly. And uh, after talking to you, it really opened my eyes. I think that I think that conversation with you also was the most taxing on my wallet that I've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Because then, oh my gosh! Because I'll tell you, once you get sucked into, I'm far from a photographer, but I, you know, I'm, I'm I'm I feel relatively competent with what I do know. And my God, if I and once you, and I'm I have that kind of addictive personality too. I bought that first camera. It's never enough. <laughs> never enough. Then you want to get full frame. Then you want to get that lens with the uh, one point two uh, aperture, and it's just like, I oh my that. gosh, I spent so much it's money that the wife doesn't know about. Rabbit hole that Adam has fallen down. Yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, your videos that your process videos that you post, I'm so uh, they're just amazing. Oh, um, thank you. Yeah, just uh, incredible, incredible. Yeah, thank, and even for that, I've I've gone backwards. For that, most of it now, uh, at least, I'm just mostly using webcams, just because I'm doing. I mean, I mean, I'm doing hundred hours of footage. Wow. I mean, to do that on, you know, uh, a DSLR or full frame camera would be. Oh my gosh, it would be. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't. I couldn't do it on a computer. Terabytes. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. Terabytes. Absolutely. Oh my goodness. But um. Yeah. It's a whole, yeah, it's always, and that's a good point. I guess that's the message to this uh, part of the episode is just like having the right tool for the job is always, always so important. And, and I bet, you know, as a photographer, you know that more than anyone about having that right lens, having that right that flash, guy, yeah. having that right uh, light, uh, even time of day, if you're doing stuff outside, uh, whether it's overcast or not, yeah, yeah, exactly. making sure you're giving yourself the, the best chance to take that best photo. Right. But there are several ways. There's not just the one way. I would just, in terms of problem solving, is I, I think there are several, uh, there are many ways in, in terms of uh, being successful and yeah. taking uh, uh, you know, some wonderful photos. And actually, just, just on that point, it, it made me wonder, because there's one thing to love photography and love the work you do, but to become you know, known in, in any industry, it's, it's when other people start noticing your work too. Would you say there was a particular photo or series or event that you photographed that made you think, you know what, I'm like, you know what, this is the right thing for me and I got to go deeper into this? Um, I, you know, I'm not certain. I think, you know, I uh, ultimately I, um, 
when I was working at Muppets, uh, a New York Times photographer came on and I networked with her and I got an interview for the art section, you know, the art uh, culture desk at the time. This is 20 years ago. And so that really having my work in the New York Times uh, really, I think, gave me more of a legitimate, uh, you know, a recognized uh, platform to work from. Yeah. So and a lot more exposure in terms of, uh, of what I was photographing. And uh, but it was all per I would say 99% was performance, because that's what I knew. That's what I was able to bring to it. Right. Um, you know, a another thing that I'm I'm thinking about is you've shown us so many of these photos and for um, especially, you know, our, our Muppet fans who who watch the show. Um, they're probably photos that they've seen before because your work is just so, so iconic in, in capturing these, these moments. Um, and what I'm realizing as we're talking here is for much as, as much as it's become a part of the archive in, in holding on to the Muppet history, it's also all of it is, is your history. Um, and I wonder what it's just meant to you to be able to have this privilege to, to document um, and, and to meet all the people you've met and, you know, uh, snap a photo of Michelle Obama uh, for the <laughs> Here I can show uh, you. There 40th episode or 40th season of Sesame. Like there's just so many milestones um, that it must, I, I can't imagine what it must feel like to know um, that you've helped preserve this art in this way. Yeah, it's, it's, it has been remarkable. It really, uh, the exposure uh, has been, I, it's just been uh, amazing. Uh, the doors that have opened to me. Uh, we re recently did last year. We had the gala for Sesame Street, and Michelle Obama was the the guest. And uh, I was assigned to be for Sesame, her photographer. You know, in terms of setups that we would do, photo ops we would do. And I had photographed her twice before on the, on the street. So to have that follow through was very generous of the workshop to let me do that. Um, you know, and, and then being a kid, I, I growing up, uh, um, you know, with Lamb Chop and photographing um, uh, uh, Sherry Lewis on Sesame Street, uh, just remar remarkable. And um, so things like that that have boyhood connection for me, uh, it's been amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I, re I remember the first time, uh, both, both at the O'Neill and the first time I visited Sesame Street and um, saw photos that you had, I later found out you had taken that I had previously seen in coffee table books or online or whatever, and thinking like, oh, that's nice that they have those printed out. And then realizing like, oh no, these were these were taken by, <laughs> these are the real photos. I've, I've been seeing the copies and um, it just kind of strikes you like of, of just all the all of the human element that goes into to recording this stuff I, I don't know I yeah I get real geeky, geeky about it uh no it's one and I'll tell you one of the wonderful things is uh is uh, we have uh they'll bring um make a wish kids on the set mm. on Sesame Street and to see these children and the puppeteers and this is their their wishes to to go on to Sesame Street uh, it, it, it's so moving beyond uh, beyond belief in terms of seeing this and the, the magic that these puppets hold and how transformative they are with these children. It's, it's, uh, you're shooting through tears. It's, yeah. uh, it's, it's amazing. It's, it's, uh, to be there is a gift yeah. and to witness it and document it. And, and I'm sure that, you know, in documenting things like that and, and everything that you have, that obviously, even if we looked at every single photo that was ever released in any venue, whether it was a, you know, a book behind the scenes books or behind the scenes videos where they show stills, that's only a fraction of what they probably actually have. This is true. Yeah. yeah. And what, I guess, I don't even know where the question is there other than like, not only how do they, I mean, I guess they choose which ones to use based on the context of whatever they're making, yeah. but like, will some of it will never be used yes. probably. Right. And yeah, I mean, you're only seeing, uh, you know, as you said, digitally now we're photographing so much 
there's so much images that we're creating and uh and i tend to overshoot and um so i need to and this is something that i'm always dealing with i need to narrow down what i'm what i'm providing because it's just it's it's too much <laughs> and yeah. even at that standpoint since you are the one who took the photo um i know i mean it's, it's you know, is, is it your photo? Is it Sesame Street's photo? Is it both of yours? Can you use a photo that they're not wanting necessarily out or? Well, I sure try, I, 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 that's a good question. I try to be, I, I don't, like I'm not posting things generally on social media. It, it's really all copyrighted. They own the copyright. So I, I, I use it very uh, restrictively. But and, you have a copyright on it as well though. Don't, don't you both have a well, copyright in some way? Or not? It, it, no, it's really there. There, I'm shooting. It's work for hire. This is okay. Uh, be, become much more. It wasn't always that way, but in in more recent years, it's become. There's a buyout, and it's it's really there. And they're copyrighted characters, so you really have to be very careful. Mm, of course. Yeah. When I'm shooting and, for the Times, it's uh, a co copyright. It's a shared mm, copyright. That's what I was thinking because I was like, I knew that existed in in, in many. Uh, ways uh, and even restrictions as far as how photos can be used, even if they own it, maybe they can't necessarily do anything they want with it, right? So it, maybe in some cases, I'm not, I'm not sure. Well, you know, with uh, if it's a cold Sesame copyright, Street, they, they, yeah. they own it. There, it's yeah. their. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, huh. you know, uh, as as we're talking about this, another thing that I'm I'm just curious about, um, because you've really sort of especially now that you're uh you know new york times published uh photographer uh you've kind of had to uh, you know get versed in the world of of journalism did you have to uh, teach yourself a new kind of sort of decorum or way to handle yourself um you know from what you were maybe used to in the muppet workshop uh just with your your pals and your friends and your coworkers versus like going into a performance space and, you know, potentially having an audience that you're not wanting to disturb and just all the rules that you need to follow in, in being a, a, a journalistic photographer? Yeah, it, you know, each venue that I'm shooting in has certain protocol. Uh, and certainly I'm shooting a lot of live concerts and live performance and the audience uh, and not disrupting the audience is, uh, is paramount. So, and where you can shoot from, it's all very dictated. Although, you know, representing the times, they try to accommodate you because they want to get the best pictures in the paper. Yeah. So that, that's- <laughs> You're their off. best friend in that situation. Yeah, <laughs> you can be, it depends. Um, and sometimes they want you to stop shooting because they don't want it. They don't want something revealed that's later in the play. Mm -hmm. So it, 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 there's a, you know, it depends on the situation. There's a variety of circumstances. The other thing is with the times, for example, you cannot Photoshop anything in terms of changing any content within a photo. Mm -hmm. It has to be as true as the reporter who's writing the story. So you can't make any adjustments other than, you know, an exposure, it's, you know, yeah. uh, cropping something, but you cannot change the content of, of the photo, which is very, you know, it's, it's, that's a, a hard and fast rule that you have to work by. Yeah. Which is very important. Hmm. So. Yeah, that's interesting. No, that's I just know that, uh, I mean, to an extent, a certain amount of exposure change can change the context in the bed. Even, you know, <laughs> yeah. I, remember, I know not, not only that, but I remember seeing this, um, there was like a, essentially a meme or uh, some demonstration of uh, how, how much, cropping a photo can change what the photo means yeah, yeah. so is that considered altering it or is that not considered altering it i i cropping is is okay and, okay. and generally though you want to give them as much of an image as possible so they can crop into it mm -hmm. if they need to for for the configuration they need on a page i was going to say then it's the layout designer's fault yeah, <laughs> if it, yeah. something gets cropped out yeah so yeah. uh you know, they want as much to work with as possible. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll try to see if I can get the graphic. So we can I, put it I, in I think I know what you mean, Adam. There's a yeah. picture I think of, um, I want to say it's one of the princes, uh, and they have like a photo of them pointing one way, but then in an, on the side view, it looks like they're giving the 
middle finger or something. I forget. Yeah, no, exactly I, I, what it I, I is, saw but... one from like wartime where it's uh, someone like uh, helping a soldier or something. And the way they showed it cropped two different ways. And my goodness, is it different? Hopefully, oh, okay. I'll have it up on the screen now. But oh. um, but yeah, just be interesting. Yeah. Get your perspective yeah. on that. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, it is a big part of the storytelling. That's what it is. Uh-huh. It's just it's a storytelling with with one image. And it is amazing how much of a story you can get out of image. I mean, the age old saying that, you know, a picture's worth a thousand words. Exactly. And it um, and it really it really if it's taken well, it really can be. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, so you want it to be as authentic as possible. Yeah. Oh, I have an image here. I thought I'd show you. This is bringing puppetry and uh, and uh, shooting humans together. I thought that I had to do a brochure. This is uh, uh, a number of years ago for um, what was it? The uh, it was for a dance uh, festival. And what I did is I had silhouettes of the dancers behind seamless with portraits of the dancers and fr- uh, of the uh, choreographers in front. So this is, oh, wow. just, you know, using silhouettes and then with portraiture. But this is being influenced by my photograph, my my puppet photography. So I took yeah, moments you could, from you could dance. see the direct influences there. Yeah, yeah, and this was part of a dance festival. Wow. So I thought I'd just share that with you. No, thank you. Uh, you know, another thing you you mentioned uh, wanting to see an artist's true authenticity, and it rem- it got me thinking about uh, your position at the O'Neill now as the director of the Emerging Artist Strand, uh, which is a, a program I've been lucky enough to go through and some of our other guests on the show. Um, can you describe what you uh, are sort of looking for in in one of those presentations for people who are uh you know looking to to go through that you know pretty um challenging <laughs> track at the o'neill yeah well it's definitely perf- the, the, the puppet artist that is ready to uh create longer works you know we have the shorter participant projects that we do at the o'neill and developing those but it's but it's an artist that's really thinking in terms of a full fuller program a fuller uh piece and to be able to take a, a part of that piece and workshop it with a company of puppeteers at the O'Neill and have mentorship, have because we have so many talented puppet artists that can be outside eyes and, uh, and, uh, and help uh, navigate through that experience of staging and uh, mounting in a workshop form an initial uh, production. And uh, a performer really thinking in, the, in those larger terms, ready for that for that experience, I think is uh, is what we're looking for. Yeah, well, and, and you guys are able to get so much out of people, um, probably more than they think that they're going to be able to do at the at the beginning of the week. Um, so yeah, um, and what yeah. we and what we try to do and what we try to recommend is they're only going to take maybe ten minutes out of a fuller piece. Is maybe to work on ten minutes that sort of has a lot of the elements that are part of the whole piece that will help them problem solve and will be the, the sort of the key to open the door as they, when they then go to work on the whole piece. Yeah, and, almost like a proof of concept in a way. Yeah. Um, yeah, showing those different elements. Yeah, during that, that week of, uh, of uh, residency at the O'Neill. Yeah, yeah, and it's so important just to get uh, outside perspectives. That's what I like so much about the O'Neill because when I had gone there for the first time, I had never been anything like that yeah you know uh, i've always been in my own little bubble by myself making stuff or with you know just a few yeah. close friends and uh you know my first year there i did a participant piece and i was assigned to you as my mentor for it and uh you were the uh, the, the director of it uh, essentially i believe that was the title of it and um and i had never been in a position like that before where it's something like that i wrote and was working on but someone else uh, was able to have that kind of impact on it as well. And, and to really, be open to that is really, uh, for a puppet, puppet artist to be open to that sort of give and take, and uh, I think is really uh, important. Yeah. Um, well, again, I, it's not, I didn't have a choice to, to really, you know, <laughs> not to say I was forced. I wasn't yeah. forced to, yeah. but yeah. The, the way it was presented is like, this is an opportunity to have yeah. Yeah, a yeah. professional doing this. So, so listen to them, of course, you know, and I didn't, I didn't find, it really made me just 
just um you, you know you always know there's different perspectives yeah. but when you're when you're like when you are kind of again i don't want to use the word force but when but when you actually enact out uh, i mean the example and part of a section of the scenes that i was doing i wanted uh this character to be aggressive and get really mad really fast and you're like no let it slow let it build no. up and i'm like i wouldn't have ever really thought of that on my own because uh, of because I had so many of my own fingers in the basket of writing it, building these characters, yeah, yeah. performing in it. Sometimes yeah. you need that outside perspective. And, um, and, and uh, it was just, there was so much value in it. And I learned a lot from you in that short amount of time oh. of uh, uh, directing uh, this piece uh, for me. And it's also being open to that. It's, you know, not everyone is open to, yeah. to hearing a feedback and to, to, uh, you know, giving over their vision and, and, and to sharing their vision. Yeah. Well, it's kind of actually reminds me of the analogy I was saying with the, the, the uh, lighting person with the photography. It's just like, you just, it's just a whole different thing. You sometimes you need, like, I hear what you're saying, but that's not how it's coming off to the audience. Let me help you actually do what you're saying you want to do. Yeah. yeah. And that's, I think a big part of a, of a director and something I learned uh, and apply to when I direct things as well now. And the other thing is that that's an opportunity often for a puppeteer that is in their piece, maybe the center of their piece mm -hmm. during that week to be outside their piece, yeah. to have other people to really have that perspective of having the luxury of being outside their own piece and to really having that, uh, that overview yeah. Yeah. that that's the process provides. Yeah, absolutely. That's so, so important. important. Yeah. Uh, did you have any other photos that you wanted to, to um, show us? Let's see. Um, I was going to show you some here. Uh, well, this is one that's, uh, this was taken by a New York Times photographer who was on set doing a story. But here I am in the corner. This ran in the Times. But this sort of gives you a, a, a point of view of where I am uh, yeah. when I'm shooting. I thought that was kind of interesting yeah. here. Wow. Uh, and how I'm cropping out the puppeteers. So I would not generally, I want to say 90% of the photos, I'm just shooting above the puppeteers heads, mm -hmm. hopefully. And when you take portraits of, of the characters, because I know a lot of times when once a scene has sort of wrapped yeah. before the puppeteers get up, you'll kind of say like, Grover, Elmo, <laughs> stay back and we're going to take a, a picture of this. Um, do you have to then like kind of say to uh, the the puppeteers like, okay, Elmo a little up, a little down, yes. you know, yeah. to fix eye lines? Because um, I imagine they're not getting your video feed into their, their monitors ever. A couple of different ever. things that we're doing is um, I, like to, I like action shots much more than the characters just looking at camera. Mm -hmm. But I do both. Uh, what we're doing as well is there's a jib, which is a, a camera that's on a on a, a long uh, cantilevered pole that's the center camera usually. And uh, I'm oftentimes shadowing that and it's uh, you know potentially getting hit by it. But when I do a setup, sometimes the, the cameraman will position there, they'll have that camera on for the puppeteers to see on their, uh, their screens. They'll frame up to that and then he'll pull out and I'll step in and take the picture. Got so this it. way they have yeah. their focus fit fixed they can see in their monitors the camera moves out i move in and take the picture and sometimes i'll say okay now look at each other let's have some interaction here as well so it's not all just looking at the camera yeah no that's great um uh yeah here you yeah, can wonderful see, insight is, into that <laughs> and this is here some shots of setups here this is i was shooting for japanese nhk a number of years and these were, this was one of the, I did just set up with the, the character's armature. And then this was taken, this is one of my favorite character uh, shots of Carol Spinney. And this was actually taken at 1993 in San Francisco at a P of A festival. He did a workshop. And then I said, let's go outside. I want to take your picture with the character. And oh, Laurent okay. Lynn is, uh, who was an art director at the time at the, at the Sesame and worked in the workshop as well, is in the character. But I love this shot here. Um, That's beautiful. Let's see here. And then um, I got to shoot a lot of puppet theater. 
over the years. This is one of my favorite pieces. This is uh, Peter and Wendy by Mabu Minds with Karen Kendall and, and uh, Basil Twist is doing the puppeteer, the puppet here of Peter. And then this is uh, um, Herman with her, uh, Hank Borwinkle, which is out of the Netherlands. And this was a piece set in, the, uh, in a concentration camp. And then uh, I'll just show you these very quickly here. I oftentimes each year I'll do a, um, a mailer, which will be a montage of photos. And I just thought I would just go through these uh, to show you different. This was travel photography in Paris that oh, I did great. a Christmas card one year. And then these are a mix of, uh, I shot a lot of Cirque du Soleil. Um, this is Evita on Broadway, Carnegie. Uh, let's see what else. But these are just a mix of different, uh, of, uh, this is Basil Twist here, his sister's follies. Just to give you an idea of a lot of the performance stuff. Wow. But it's catching, like this is, you know, catching at the, at the, at the pinnacle, composition. Yeah. Here's some, a lot of theater shots here. And no, I love these collages and yeah, yeah so seeing all the a, work come together and the different performances and different shows yeah, and such. Thank you. So, uh, so that just gives you an idea of a, a variety of uh, and Muppet stuff. So this would be a setup here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, this is great. Thank you so much for, for sharing all of this. It's yeah. been so, so informative. And uh, I, I know a lot of people are going to take so much from this. Um, yeah. You know, something that I, uh, we, we ask everybody <clears throat> who comes on the show, um, it, this being puppeteers, is if you have a good moment uh, from either in the workshop or on set, or, you know, when you're trying to avoid a, 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 a camera from overhead um if you have a good puppeteer story of when things didn't go quite right in the moment but we could have a good laugh uh oh. have a good laugh now let's see <laughs> i mean I, I i don't know if i have anything that's a good laugh um so there's got to have been a puppet that bumped over a camera lens and broke it or something <laughs> right <laughs> no i'm just, whatever yeah. um yeah i'm just uh, I, I, I would just say one of the, um, I could tell wonderful stories about seeing performers work and, uh, you know, seeing like Jim and Frank when they would work, when they would get an insert script of Ernie and Bert and seeing them develop, uh, they would have the script, not that they wouldn't regard the script, but those were their characters. It was like watching Laurel and Hardy work and developing a scenario or a sequence of action. Um, and it's like watching the puppeteers now. I have to say, I often see these puppeteers on Sesame Street who have now taken over these roles. And I wish Jim was there to see in what incredible hands, what he's created, how they have taken on another life, how they continue to live and the integrity that these performers uh, and the creativity that they have given these characters is, 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 is beyond belief. Uh, uh, you know, I would, uh, I think that's, uh, th that's something I take away from the show. Yeah. Um, so. No, that's wonderful. And, and so great. I'm sure, um, you know, for those, those performers too, who've, who've taken on those roles mm -hmm. to have people like you, um, who has the, <laughs> has the thing to compare it to, to kind of be cheering them on, I'm sure just means yeah. the world for them. So. Well, also, you know, just being a photographer, um, you know, what I see in front of me, what I see through my eyes, through my camera, um, there's sometimes, sometimes uh, uh, disbelief in terms of what, what is, what's it happening there. And having that, it's like a microscope in which I'm experiencing, you know, the world, uh, the world of creativity before me and just astounded by what's playing out and being moved by what is there. Yeah. So it's a gift in that way. I, well, I feel like I'm creating with them. And, and at the same time, it's it's coming into me and it's a gift to me. 
Yeah, you know, that kind of just makes me wonder too, because I know you, you know, you started kind of doing puppetry and building puppets. Now that you're doing more of the photography, do you ever still miss that building the puppets and a little bit of performing? Or do you think that being able to document and and live through these performers kind of this way and documenting this process is like the perfect marriage of these two things and as an equally fulfilling? Well, I, I, I do like to work with my hands. I did like to work with my hands. So I think that, um, you know, part of me, I'm not using a part of me, but I'm using other parts. And so, um, you know, maybe the creativity is in the Photoshop and that's more of the hands-on and the manipulation that way, uh, you know, other skills that I have. And I, I did do directing, you know, I did do pieces at the O'Neill and that was very satisfying and, and that part of me. And, uh, you know, I think in another life I would have been a director or, a, you know, those are, but, but life takes you in directions of opportunity and uh, doors open that I didn't know that I was gonna pursue. I, I would never have said in my college years, if someone told me I was gonna be a photographer, I would never, that would not have been I would never have seen that as a possibility. Yes. So you, you don't know. That's the other thing I tell people who are beginning their journey, be open to possibilities. I mean, that's a favorite word that Albert Grosser always used is discovering the possibilities of whatever you're creating. And you don't know where your life is gonna be, is gonna take you, where your creativity is gonna take you, but being open to those possibilities, that's the, uh, that's the gift uh, to carry with you. And, and uh, things will happen in your life that you never even thought were possible. So for that, I am, I, I am thankful. And, uh, and I, I say, and I share that with people to be open to that. That's beautiful. Yeah, no, it. that's, a, that's, <laughs> that's, that's wonderful too. You know, it just, um, yeah. yeah, you know, I just, it just, it's got me thinking about a couple other things a little bit too. Um, just thinking about, um, you know, how, how, how wonderful it is that, again, that Sesame Street uh, takes on, has a foresight to think about documenting this part of it. And I think that's something I'd want to encourage listeners who are doing their own productions to, to try to budget that in. Because I can, like I mentioned in the beginning about thinking that it might not be seen as an essential um, uh, aspect of a production, but the history of what you're doing is so important. And I think a smaller productions don't do it enough to hire somebody. And I'm lucky in some of our past productions that Cameron had the foresight to bring on a photographer. I never even would have thought of that. You know, uh, I know a lot of the performers uh, were taking their own photos and actually uh, even on set and stuff. Sometimes we see some of the Sesame street performers and whatnot yes. uh, have their own little behind the scenes photos, yeah. which is an interesting aspect to it too. But there's just so much value and in, in not just documenting it, but also, you know, hiring somebody to make that their priority and their job. And it's, you're just going to thank yourself later for it. Yeah. And just to document the, uh, the world around you, I, with the cell phone, I mean, now I have a dog, I'm out in the park, I'm walking, you know, and I, and when I'm walking in, I, I'm taking pictures, even with my cell phone and I've gotten some amazing you know, photos, learning how to use my cell phone and it's there and it's not carrying a heavy weight of, you know, equipment and all. And it's remarkable, but it's seeing the world around you and, 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 and documenting it can be very rewarding and will also inform you when you go to photograph your, your puppetry. Yeah, no, wonderful. And what's the best way for people to, to follow your work and to see pictures that you're doing? Uh, well, I have a Facebook page and I have an Instagram to tell you that I'm not using it that much at this point in these past months because mm -hmm. of, of the pandemic. And um, so it, and I should use it more, but, um, but that generally I'm posting, I used to do a photo of the week and all of that on mm -hmm. Facebook. But when I was working, things that I've really spent the last few months really dealing with my archives and uh, getting my, my archives in order. And not that they haven't been, but just working on that. And um, so I haven't, my output hasn't been. And 
hopefully it's going to i i have hope oh, it's all right just a little spring cleaning you know yeah, we all do yeah, a little yeah. quarantine cleaning yeah. now there's a like, like you said there's a little but, but and, definitely check out and, a social and you have a media. beautiful yeah, website and, as well and here uh, i'll just show you i this is my office and uh i have a lot of images and i've been doing a lot of framing of work and uh that sort of thing and having a great time doing that so uh yeah so anyway. definitely check out his Instagram, his Facebook page, and his website. It's all on the screen now. And uh, and be, be sure to follow all the beautiful pictures to come. Thank you, guys. This has been uh, truly wonderful. I really uh, appreciate yeah. had a great time. I hope it's been yeah. good. <laughs> Thanks so much, Richard. Same. Richard, oh, thank pleasure. you so much. Uh, we pleasure. really appreciate you uh, coming on for our special Cheers to Puppeteers. And uh, we'd Excellent. love to have you back. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Bye. We're at the end of another episode of Puppeteers, but the fun doesn't stop here. Visit puppeteers.com for show notes and links to projects mentioned in this episode. Make sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at PuppeteersPod, where we're posting new things every day. Puppeteers is edited by Matt Bowen and made possible thanks to viewers like you. If you enjoy this content, you can join our incredible Patreon patrons who are supporting the show for as little as $1 per episode. Those folks get access to early releases, uncut episodes, official Cup O tiers just like we use on the show, and can even submit interview questions for our guests. Go to patreon.com slash puppeteerspod to learn more. Another great way to support Puppeteers is rating and reviewing us on iTunes, leaving a comment or subscribing to this channel, or tell a friend about your favorite episode. Thanks again for joining us on Puppeteers Puppetry Shop Talk, in-depth interviews with the world's most passionate puppeteers. Hosted by me, Adam Krutinger. And me, Cameron Garrity. Anyway, the program I have would look like this on your screen. Yeah, and you know what? I, I did a little research, and yes. uh, if you want to be able to show this to us, um, yes. that's great. But we're um, just because we don't, it, it's a little clunky for people to be seeing, um, you know, your your Lightroom or whatever. I can't quite tell what program program this is, but um, I'm able to. I've pinned you though, <laughs> so I'm able to just re be recording you, and you're showing this to me and Adam. Yeah, yeah, yeah.